Hello everyone in the new video about Spring Cloud AWS. Today we will talk about RDS, which is a relational database service, and of course how Spring Cloud AWS integrates with it. We will cover quite a few different topics. There will be an intro to RDS, we will show how to connect to the RDS service from a traditional Spring Boot application, what are the benefits of using Spring Cloud AWS, when you should use it, when you should not use it, and in the end we will create a an application highly scalable that can utilize under the hood RDS instances with read replicas. So if you are not interested in each one of these things, then you are very welcome to just skip it. There is a table of contents in the description. You can also choose on this progress bar which section you are exactly interested in so that you don't waste your time. So first of all, what is AWS RDS? RDS stands for Relational Database Service. It's a service on AWS that lets you create, operate, manage relational databases like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, MariaDB, and also Amazon Aurora that I will talk a little bit later. So how is it different from running actually the normal Postgres installation, for example, on an EC2 instance, because you, there's nothing stopping you from taking Postgres using some Chef, Puppet or Ansible and just provision the database on EC2. And it will be actually cheaper. So RDS takes care of backups, maintenance, upgrading, updating the databases to the newer versions, but it also offers some key features like high availability. So using RDS, you can have a multi-AZ deployment where a copy of database is placed in each availability zone. And it means that if one availability zone is having some issues or it's completely unavailable, the RDS will be able to switch to another one. It also offers uh, scaling databases with read replicas. So in the end, if you are running a production workload on Amazon and you are not very limited with money, then RDS is the way to go. Okay, so now let me show you how to create a database on Amazon RDS. Okay, now let's go to AWS Management Console and find RDS. It will be listed somewhere under the database section. And here we can create a new database instance. So we go to databases and then create database. And here we will be able to choose uh, one of the available engines. As I mentioned before, we have MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server, but we also have Amazon Aurora. What is Amazon Aurora? It's a special type of database. It's a proprietary one. Amazon RDS is the only place where you can spin up Amazon Aurora. And it's a database that is compatible either with MySQL or with Postgres, but Amazon claims that it's 10 times faster. It also enables features like auto-scaling. So definitely if you are having some serious workloads and you need performance, Aurora is something that you should consider. I will not use Amazon Aurora here. One reason is that Spring Cloud AWS does not support Amazon Aurora yet. So I will just go with a standard Postgres installation and I can choose one of the templates. If it's production, dev test, free tier. You have to know that choosing these templates only pre-configures a list of settings below here. So it, you can change them anyway later. I will select free tier. Then I have to pick my database instance identifier. So in case my application is called my app, this could be co just called my app dash DB, whatever, like it's completely up to you. Then we have a username and then we have a password. I will choose test one, two, three, four, five, six. Then we can choose the instance size. The In the free tier, dbt2 micro is the only one that it's available. With a storage, we can leave it as, a, as it is. We are not able to choose multi-AZ deployment in a free tier, but multi-AZ deployment is in general very handy feature, especially if you're running in production. If we would select multi-AZ deployment, then RDS would create a copy of this database in a different availability zones. And these databases will be kept in sync, which means that if one of the availability zones has some issues, RDS is able to automatically switch the endpoint to connect to a different database. And of course, 
the more availability zones we have, the more safe we are that in case of outage of two availability zones, there is still the third one available, for example. So this is definitely something you should consider when you are, when you are using production workloads, but you have to also keep in mind that you pay double. So for each instance in each availability zone, you pay like, a, like it would be a separate instance. Then we have a connectivity section, and I will do something that you should not definitely do in a real application. So I will select default VPC. You should never select the default VPC. I will just do it to keep this video more focused. And I think I will talk about the VPCs and why you shouldn't use default VPC in a video in the future. Also, I would like to connect to this database from our local machine. So I have to choose here that this database is publicly accessible. So then I would be able just to, from my local machine over JDBC, just to connect to this instance. Okay. And then there is nothing else we need to check. So I click create database. Creating RDS databases takes a while. It takes actually ages. It feels like ages. It can be either a few minutes or it can be even over 10 minutes. This is not a big deal for this video. I will just pause it and then we will continue. But it becomes a little bit painful, especially if you need to create RDS database, for example, in your integration test before your integration test run, because even if the tests take two minutes to run, this whole process of spinning up RDS database and then shutting it down just can take overall like half an hour. Okay, so I will pause now and then I will be back when this database is finally created. Okay, so the database is ready now. The status is available. We can go into the details to see exactly what's the endpoint so that we can connect it from our local machine. So I will just take it, copy the endpoint and go to IntelliJ, but you can go to any database software you can use like Squirrel SQL, I think the, there is also DB Weaver, whatever you use. And uh, I used the project that we developed in the previous video, getting started with Spring Cloud AWS as a starting point. So we will modify it to connect to the RDS instance. So if you haven't seen this video, it should appear, a link should appear somewhere here. So now I will go to the database section and I will create a new data source. So I will choose, where's Postgres? Postgres? and then paste this host into the host section. The user is Postgres and the password is the same that I put in the wizard. So it was test one, two, three, four, five, six. And then if I hit test connection, unfortunately it will be still not able to connect because our VPC configuration prevents from getting into the default VPC from anywhere outside. So there is one more step that I have to do. And again, this is the step that you should not do for production, right? From production, you want to keep your VPC secure. So I have to go to EC2 and then to security groups. And in the security group, I have to configure the inbound rule. So I click edit inbound rules and add a rule. I can search here for Postgres and then say that I want to allow the connection from anywhere. So then I just click save rules. And once I get back to IntelliJ and then hit test connection, it should be green. Yes, so now I'm connected. Just keep in mind, don't do it for production. We just do it here to take a shortcut. Okay, so now I click okay. Now I'm able to connect to this database. So the next step would be to add some sort of persistence to the application. And we will just use the very standard stack so to, to not make things any more complex than they should be. So I will just add here a dependency to Spring Boot Starter Data JPA. So let's just copy this one and we add Spring Boot Starter Data JPA. Okay, and then I also need to add a dependency to Postgres driver. And I never really remember what's the artifact and the group ID, but I believe it should be just this. I don't need to specify the version because Spring Boot will auto configure it for me. Okay, and now we are good to go. 
So we have to configure now the data source. So I go to application properties or application YAML, depending on which flavor you use. And there is a spring data source URL. So we have to put the JDBC URL, which is JDBC colon PostgreSQL, and then the endpoint, whoops, the endpoint that we've seen in the instance details. So I will go again to RDS. select db instances, go to my app dash db, copy this endpoint, put it here, and then slash the name of the database. What was the name of the database? I don't exactly remember. I think it's Postgres by default. Which one did we configure here? Database is Postgres, yes, schema public, okay. And I, of course, have to put also Spring data source username, which is Postgres and Spring data source password test one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's create some entity and Spring data JPA repository so that we can actually persist something and send fetch it. So it will be like a canonical example. There will be a person entity with an auto generated ID. So it will be ID generated value, we will choose the strategy to be identity. And then it will be long ID. And then we will add two fields, first name, last name, we need a default constructor, because of JPA. And I would also like to have a constructor just that takes first name and last name. So let's add these getters and also let's add a two string method because it will be handy maybe with we when we debug it. Okay, and then we add a person repository, which is an interface and it will extend JPA repository person to long. Okay, that's good. And now let's persist some data on the application startup just so that we can be sure that it actually, that our application is able to connect that persisting works well. I don't need this Amazon S3 here anymore. I will just inject here person. Oh no, first, before we do it, let's create a, okay, let's actually do it. So let's put person repository and then we person repository, we save new person, John Smith and also Jane Smith. So now if I start the application, oh no, before we do it, uh, let's also tell Hibernate to create tables for us so that I don't have to waste time doing it myself. Again, something I wouldn't recommend to do in the production system, in production, real application, use something like Flyway or, or Liquibase. But in this case, I just will choose DDL auto to create drop and it will make hibernate create tables when the application goes up and drop the tables when application goes down. So it's a perfectly uh, suitable feature for all kind of demos. Okay, so now let's run the application. Application has started, I can go now to the databases. And likely I need to refresh it so that IntelliJ fetches the changes in the database schema. And we should see here one table, person, and if I see in the content of this table, there is nothing and I'm not exactly sure why. Oh no, sorry. There are two entries. So exactly what we expected. Good. Okay, so we connected to the to the RDS instance, we didn't use Spring Cloud AWS at all. So the question is now, why would I actually even want to use Spring Cloud AWS? So Spring Cloud AWS RDS integration comes with three features. One is that we don't need to put this whole JDBC URL. So with Spring Cloud AWS, it's enough if we put the database instance name and the framework will figure out exactly what's the URL for us. That's great, but it's not like a killer feature, right? Another thing is that if we would choose the multi AZ deployment, Spring Cloud AWS will be able to retry the anything we want to do with the database if one of these instances go down. So what happens under the hood is that 
one availability zone goes down, Amazon has to internally change the endpoint to link to another one, but it takes, let's say, a couple of seconds. So in our application, like normally, we would just throw an exception that we can't connect. But what Spring Cloud AWS can do is that it will retry a couple of times and will eventually connect to the existing database. That's the feature that is not maybe exactly handy when we are talking about web applications or the applications when we expect to get the response quite immediately because it can take some seconds. So it's, let's say, advice to use it when we are running some scheduled jobs or batch jobs. And the last one is that is the most important one is that RDS enables us to create read replicas for the database instances, which gives us this option that if we have a read heavy application and most of the time the data is read, not updated, then we can scale it. And Spring Cloud AWS gives us a very easy declarative way to tell that this operation should go to one of the existing read replicas instead of to the master database. So let's see now how to do it. We will start with adding Spring Cloud AWS JDBC starter to POM XML. We keep Spring Boot Starter Data JPA as it is. We don't remove actually anything from here, but we will just add a new one. So it will be Spring Cloud Starter dash AWS dash JDBC. Then we refresh Maven and we have to go to application properties. We don't need this line anymore. We also don't need any of these lines, but instead we will configure cloud.aws.rds. And unfortunately, you will not have auto completion here yet. Starting from version 2.3, Splink Cloud AWS 2.3. There will be normal auto-completion, something that you are very used to when you're working with Spring Boot, but currently it's not the case. And then after dot comes the uh, DB instance ID. So we have to go back to RDS console to see what is the name of our database instance, and we will find it here. So it's myapp-db. And then we just can set username, Postgres, and then we set the password, test one, two, three, four, five, six. And now if I start the application again, it will, under the hood, find that, okay, I'm trying to connect to my app dash DB. Okay, it failed. I forgot to add something here. We also need to add a database name, which will be Postgres in our case. So let's start the application again. Okay, cool. Now it's started. So under the hood, Spring Cloud AWS checks that we want to connect to database myapp-db. It will use AWS SDK and fetch the endpoint for us. So now we have basically an equivalent of what we had here. The one thing only you need to remember that at this stage, it doesn't use the connection pool that you pre-configured with Spring Boot. So by default, you would normally use uh, Hikari CP, uh, but instead it uses Tomcat JDBC connection pool. And it's not very easy really to replace it with something else. You can tweak it, we can configure it, but let's say you lose a little bit of flexibility, something that I don't really like. That means that also we will change it in the future versions of Spring Cloud AWS. Okay, cool. So now let's uh, add one read operation. I will also add here a sp Spring Boot Starter web so that we can create an endpoint and uh, this endpoint will just fetch the data from the, uh, from the database. So let's add a person controller, which will be a REST controller, and it will have like a get mapping to persons, and it will return a list of person. And we want to use a person service find all. So we will add a new class person service that will act as an application service. What am I doing here? Okay, let's just do it normally private final person service 
and let's create this class. So this class will have a dependency to person repository. And let's say we, it will have two methods. One will be uh, register, which will take first name, last name. Under the hood, it will just do this person repository, save new person, first name, and last name. And then it will also have another method, find all. That will just return this person repository find all. This class will be annotated as a service because this is our application service layer. And we also want to make it transactional. But with this difference that find all is a read operation. So we could mark it as a transactional read only true. And this is the hint to Spring Cloud AWS to use read replica instead, of course, if read replicas are configured. So far, we haven't configured any read replicas. So let's go to AWS console again. We are now in RDS databases and in the database instance we created, and then we can choose action create read replica. We can also choose what is the type of instance, if it should be multi AZ deployment, we just stick to defaults, we only have to make it publicly accessible because still we are connecting from our local machine. Okay, good. So now let's do create read replica. And we can create more of these read replicas. Of course, you have to pay for them. Okay, DB instance identifier cannot be blank. That's true. So I have to put here what would be the RDS instance ident identifier. I will just call it my app DB read replica one. And then let's create a read replica. And we will, we can also create more read replica. So let's just create another one. So again, create read replica. Then let's go to DB instance identifier, my app DB read replica two, and only change the connectivity that it's publicly available. Okay. And then we create read replica. And then again, we have to wait a couple of minutes because this is RDS and it takes time. So let's go to databases and wait until these three statuses will change to available. Okay, so now we can see that all, all the database and together with read replicas have status available, meaning that they are ready. Just remember, don't get too crazy with the number of read replicas because you pay for each one like for a normal database. So this is like having a multi AZ setup plus read replicas is a very easy and quick way to get a really high AWS bill. Okay, so now how can we utilize these read replicas? We spoke that we can add here a read only true. And this is the hint to Spring Cloud AWS that this should go to a read replica. And of course we are not allowed then inside this transaction to write to the database. So this can be only reading operation, but it's not over. We also have to go to application.properties and for this database instance, change the property of read replica support equals true. And then let's just finish what we have started here. So we have this person service and then we have a find all. And now it should all compile and work. So now let's go back. Let's start the application. So now on the application startup, we save these two entities. RDS under the hood replicates them to the read replica. So whenever we call this slash persons endpoint, it should just go to the read replica. Okay, so let's just go to the terminal and call HTTP 8080 slash persons. And we got the result. And this result comes from the read replica. The one thing you have to keep in mind only is that when you use read replicas, the data between the master node and read replica is not replicated synchronously, meaning that it goes, it's replicated asynchronously. So there is a 
little bit of delay depending on how much data you write to the master instance. And the more you write, then the replication lag can become greater. So this also means that you have to keep in mind that it may happen that you read from the read replica and the data there is not up to date. That's just something to keep in mind. It's perfectly fine for many cases, many applications, but in some uh, it's absolutely unacceptable. Okay, and this would be it regarding Spring Cloud AWS and RDS integration. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you did, please like this video, subscribe to this channel, share it with your friends, share it on Twitter, send it on your company Slack, and so on. The more you spread the news, the more YouTube will, of course, promote this video, so there are chances that others will see it as well. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.